Welcome to Better Business Results. My name is John Witt, and I'm your host. I work with business owners, executives, and sales professionals in 30 minutes or less each week to generate better business results. I'm the owner of Business Wit, a published author, and a senior leader in the Focal Point International Coaching Organization, where we have over 180 coaches on all seven continents. Albert Einstein's quoted as saying that compound interest is the most powerful formula in the universe. If you were to improve your business one-tenth of 1% on a daily basis, you would be almost 24% more effective and more efficient at the end of one year. You too can harness the power of compound interest for your business, generating three action items each week. That's what we're here to do. Let's get started. Today we're joined by Andrew Grieber with Grieber Tax Advisors. You got it. Andrew, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as usual, we ask you to share a little bit about how you got started. How did you get into the tax advisory business? Give us a little bit of that story and share that with our audience. Sure. Well, I've been involved in the accounting industry for more than 15 years. For me, it started out in high school where I took a vocational course uh, as extra credit to learn accounting um, with a group of adults, and I ended up doing very well. I received a 99% in that class. That might have been the highest grade I've ever so received in Natural high accounting competency. Exactly, exactly. So I spent uh, more than 15 years in corporate and small business accounting, working with financial accounting and ultimately tax accounting. I had the opportunity to work with my father-in-law and help him with his local CPA firm uh, for many years and uh, spent many Many an hour preparing tax returns. I started from the basics of entering in tax, in tax information, having clients sign the returns, ultimately making copies and binding the copies. So I really learned the business very well. From the ground up. From the ground up, exactly. And as kind of the new kid on the block, a what we would call a problem case would come in, and that would involve working with the IRS to resolve a type of a problem. It could be an audit, somebody could owe money, and they would assign the case to me. In fact, one of my first weeks working in this business, my father-in-law came to me and he said, we have a client who hasn't filed his corporate tax returns for six years. The IRS has given us two weeks to get them filed, take care of it. And I was thinking to myself, what's a corporate tax return? I had worked in financial accounting for so long, but ultimately, you know, I spent a lot of time, I figured it out, and we resolved the problem. So from that point on, I developed a very strong passion, specifically in the tax world as well. I uh, would work on the tax problems and really found that that was a core strength for me. I really enjoyed working in taxes, but also solving the problems that our clients would come to us with. Well, I tell you, I'm glad that, that, that you enjoy it because I'm, I'm personally not an accounting guy. You know, but if I was going to hire an accounting guy or hire a tax guy, I would hire somebody that really enjoys what it is that they do. All right, so share a little bit about your, you know, your, who benefits the most from your products and services. Sure. So we work with individuals and small business owners that have found themselves in what I call a mess with the IRS. They owe a lot of money to the IRS for one reason or the other, and their case is very, very complex. They may feel hopeless. They don't know how to resolve it. So they come to us and we work through the, the problems with them. And okay, great. And, and so if you... If you have a mess with the IRS, that's hopefully not something anybody gets into, but um, it, it happens, right? It does. And so, um, what are the types of the mess? What are the type of messes that they have, right? Sure. What are the t t typical challenges? Right. Well, we focus on three main areas. We represent clients who are being audited by the IRS, the Franchise Tax Board here in California, or really any state taxing agency in the country. We also work with clients that have filed their taxes, but they've owe they owe a lot of money and they just can't pay it back. And most clients may not realize, but owing money to the government is not the same as owing money to a credit card company. The government has a lot of power. They can actually involuntarily take the money from you if you decide not to pay. And so we help clients work through those issues. And our third area are, is working with clients who haven't filed taxes for many, many years. We've gone as far back as 25 years Wow! Uh, in our firm here. 25 years. Um... Yeah, so messing with the IRS, totally different. Credit card sends you statements, says, listen, you owe us, and they might call you, they might put you on some sort of a calling campaign, uh, but they can't reach into your account, they can't reach into your checking account, they can't do a lot of other things that the IRS can exactly. do. Exactly. Right? So when you run into those things, and this is how you're helping your clients, what's your process? How do you, how do you solve right. those challenges? So one of the main reasons why I started a firm to specialize in this is that I believe that when clients go through an issue, such as a problem with the IRS or a governmental agency, they need to meet with someone face-to-face -to, -face 
and discuss their problems, someone who will listen to them. So the first step in the process is we meet with our clients and we find out exactly what's going on. What happened? How did you get into this mess? It happened. Let's deal with it. Okay? Right. We're not going to go in as to, as to, to, to what you should have right. done. It's just more like I'm no blaming, assess, no judgments. Assess Let's, where we're at today. Exactly. Where, what, what, where, where are we so that we can figure out the best plan to get out of that? Exactly. Kind of, yeah. So we find out where they're at. We find out what their current situation is today. You know, maybe they they earned millions of dollars in the past that generated this liability, but their situation could be totally different today. So we take a look at what that situation is, and we take that information, and we will actually contact the agency that they're having an issue with, be it the IRS or the state agency, and we'll let that them know that they are being represented, that they are taking the problem seriously, and that they do wish to resolve this in a timely and mutually beneficial manner. We'll take that information and combine it with the information learned from the client, and we'll put together a strategy. We'll assess the situation, and we'll come up with the best strategy to, again, mutually satisfy the client and the government uh, in, a, in a process. Once that strategy is implemented, we'll then have to negotiate with the governmental agencies because, you know, we have two ways of thinking. The government wants as much as they can get. The client can't pay it, so we have to find a way to meet halfway in the middle. So Some compromise. A compromise, yeah. exactly. That's a good way to put it. And once the problem is ultimately solved, we will work with our clients to make sure that they don't get into the same situation in the future. And that's a very important factor for the government as well. Well, it's got to be a very scary situation for people that are in this place um, and, and not, you know, taking care of the problem, hiring the right professional advisor, uh, somebody that's used to it, done it, it can, can face off with the IRS as needed, right? Because not everybody really wants to do that or has the knowledge exactly. or the skill set to do that. Um, that, 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 that I can see that. But having a plan so that you don't get there again. Right. All right. So what's your biggest success story? I know you've got a bunch of them, but give me your biggest. Success sure. No story. problem. Any client that successfully resolves their case is a success story to me. However, one specific instance is uh, was a single mother that we worked with. Uh, for personal and financial reasons, she found herself owing close to $300,000 to the IRS, about $272,000 to be exact. She had done very well in the past and found herself now struggling financially, but the IRS was after her. They, they wanted as much as they could get. So two hundred seventy thousand dollars. Exactly. What they wanted. Yeah. Exactly. So we took a look at her situation and we filed what's called an offer and compromise for her. And you know we put the package together. We negotiated and we explained the situation and we were able to settle the debt for fourteen thousand dollars, which made her very happy, made us very happy. That uh, is an amazing, reasons. amazing reduction. Um, I, I didn't. I had no idea that that was possible. I'm impressed. Yes. I mean, I hear the radio ads, right? Right. But, and this is one that obviously fits into that case. Not all of them are going to be that successful, but. Right. Um, so, so the other thing that we that we always like to ask you is like, you know, that took a while. I don't know how long that took, but that took a little while. But, but you know, what, what kind of experience does your client have, you know, day one when they meet you? Most of our clients will tell us after the first meeting that they feel an instant sense of relief. Um, They've been working with this and worrying about this way too long. They've finally taken a step to address it, and they've told us that the calm and the relief that they feel is immeasurable. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the stress right, of having the IRS looking over your shoulder or sitting on your shoulder or whatever is, is, is can I just imagine that's just scary as heck. Um, and the fact that they take this step and, and instantly, literally day one, it's like, hey, we got, you know, we're solving. We're creating a solution. Exactly. Kind of exactly. All right. Well, listen, thanks for sharing your story with, with our audience. Um, in addition to what you provide for your clients, you know, you are a small business owner also. That's a small correct. business owner as well. Um, and so in terms of growing your practice, your practice is there's you and, and you've got a few uh, associates. Right. We, and what are your biggest challenge? What kind of challenges do you? So right now in my business, finding the time to free up my time uh, to go out and seek new opportunities is always a challenge. And through part of that is delegation. Um, I am very fortunate that I have wonderful uh, associates working with me, but sometimes I feel that I need to handle the problem myself. I need to get on this right away. You know, it would only take me one minute to do it, but that time seems to add up. You know, before I know it, my whole day, a whole day has gone by, and I haven't been able to focus on seeking out those new opportunities. Well, I mean, there's people out there that need your services, and they... I mean, if you're not available, 
they can't they can't they can't reach you they can't connect with you they can't they can't solve their problems so you almost have a responsibility to figure out how to do this right because there's people out there that need that need what you do right all right so we're going to share uh the three eyes of the entrepreneur right and i've shared this with other sh- other uh, other guests uh because this this position of time right and where should i spend my time and how can i spend my time on the most important stuff uh, and what you've said is, hey, I need to get out here, but I'm stuck and I'm doing these kinds of things. So we'll go through the three eyes of the entrepreneur, share a little bit about how that works, and then we'll talk about what maybe some of the different things that you could start to look at and do a little bit differently. Because ideally, we would come up with three improvement strategies, three improvement ideas for you and your business. Uh, the people that are watching this show will be able to hear you, our discussion, and maybe those ideas will work for them. Or maybe they'll come up with three other ideas, but we want to come up with three because if we can come up with three ideas to improve our business on a weekly basis, we can make a dramatic improvement over a period of time, right? So three action items in one week is not a big deal, but if you did them three weeks, three a week, every week on top of every week, now you'd have close to 150 business improvement action items at the course of a year, over the course of a year, and you know there's a guarantee that that's going to move the needle, right? That's going to make your business more effective. It's going to generate more revenue, more profits, et cetera, whatever you're looking for from a business perspective. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about the three eyes of the business owner, and this is the way it works. In the beginning, right, we have a an outwardly view on it, and you thought, you know, you were working your accounting firm and everything else, and you said, listen, I really think I could start this business. I think I could start Grieber Tax Advisors. And uh, in this particular view, this is what we call the entrepreneur view, and this is where you start to think about, you know, who are my customers, who could I service, what are my products? So this is the, you ask a lot of questions like what if and how could I? There's a bunch of different things that really uh, play a role here. Um, so certainly, after, cer- certainly shortly after that, we start to think about, you know, actually delivering these products and services. We start to get some clients. Hey, that's a good thing, right? Uh, and when that happens, we have to focus inward on the business, right? And how do we manage the business more effectively? So we ask different questions. We ask things like when and how much and how many, etc. cetera. Um, and then ultimately, that's the manager role. And then ultimately, uh, we have to be very, very careful to not get into the what we call the technician trap or googly eyes, right? <laughs> googly eyes is this person that's doing anything and everything about the show. Now, now this, this concept is based on a book by Michael Gerber, and he wrote a book called The E-Myth Revisited. And uh, I'll share that, that Mary is a, uh, runs a pie shop. She learned to make pies at the foot of her aunt when she was a kid. And the aroma and the energy and the holiday and all that other stuff just said this is what she really wants to do. And Michael meets her in the, in the kitchens of the pie shop. And she's, it's 11 o'clock at night. She's got 50 pies to do by tomorrow. All her employees have gone home and she's covered with flour. And, and the problem is she's stuck in this technician trap or what we call the founder's trap. All the employees, you know, they, their hourly rate, they come in, they do A, B, C, D, then they go home. And so she's ordering and she's creating and she's delivering and she's doing all of these other kinds of things. And when we get stuck in that trap, right, because we're doing all that other stuff, that means that we can't do that stuff in the manager role. And that means we certainly can't do that stuff in the entrepreneur role. Exactly. And what's really important to understand here, thinking in terms of this, is that, um, <clears throat> think in terms of the technician. If you were going to hire somebody in your business, for example, to say answer phones or filing or things like that, stuff that you have to do, right? How much would you pay somebody like that? What kind of hourly rate would you pay? What the market bears? Yeah, I yeah. would say. So give me an idea. What, what do you think the market would bear for that? For someone in, in, in our line, possibly 15 to $20 an hour. 15 to 20 bucks an hour, right? Okay, great. So now, you know, as we grow the business and we get three or four of those people, five of those people, now you hire an office manager, right? So they can take care of all of the office stuff. It has to happen. We've got an office running. How much would you pay an office manager? it would be closer to $40 an hour. $40 an hour, right? And we use a, a, an hourly rate for a year of about 2,000 hours, mostly because it's very easy to multiply, right? So initially we got thirty, maybe forty thousand dollars for the technician or the the, the administrative assistant, and the office manager is going to make seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year, All right? But now you're the owner, you're the entrepreneur. How much do you want to make? I want to make unlimited. Unlimited. Uh, can I? That depends. Well, two things happen. Number one, as people go into business, they they usually want to make a lot more than the office manager, right? Right. And uh, but the thing is that the market sets the technician role, the market sets the manager role, but you get to set what you want from the entrepreneur role. And so a pretty classic one from business owners, they want to make 150 bucks an hour or 100 bucks an hour or 200 bucks an hour, depending on vocation they're in, right? And, uh, but you get to decide whatever that is, right? And so I encourage my clients when I spend some time with them is figure out what, they, what is that, right? What are we trying to get done here? 
So let's just assume that we're going to pick 150 because it's a number that we can continue the conversation on. And if you're spent, if you want to make $150 an hour, the key to this whole process is that you have to do things, you have to do activities and tasks that are worth $150 an hour. If you're doing activities and tasks that are worth $15 or $20 an hour, then you're costing yourself money. If you're doing activities and tasks that are worth $40 an hour or $80 an hour or whatever that number is, you're costing yourself money. Wow. So, so you have to figure out, A, what are those $150 an hour items? Be, and then we have to figure out how do we get all these other tasks done? Because if you're doing the $150 an hour item, you can certainly afford to pay somebody $20 an hour or $40 an hour. right? So we have to figure out what those things are, and then we have to take a look at all of these other items that we have there. So you make a list, and you figure out what are all of these things, and then we talk about how do we, how do we transition these to somebody else, right? We're going to figure out where you need to go, and then we're going to figure out how do we slowly move you from these items, lower, lower value items, technician or manager type items, into these upper value items. And the way you do that is you, you can delegate to other people. You can, uh, technology plays a huge role, right? So you, 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 you have to stop doing something. If you stop doing it and it's important, then somebody else has to start doing it. Or you can do less of it or you can become more efficient at it, in which case the minutes that you save, even if you're still doing it, the minutes that you save can be applied to the $150 an hour type activities. So that's really an important component. And we just go through and make this list of what all of these things are. And do you think you could transition all those activities at once? No. 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 Not yeah. <laughs> and by the way, there's some learning that goes along with that, right? And then learning how to delegate. If you are going to delegate, how do we get somebody to do these things and, and do them well and, and effectively and efficiently? Um, so there's some learning strategies. But the key to that is understanding that that is an absolute necessity if you're going to earn the $150 an hour. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck doing 15 and $20 an hour stuff. I also think a key component, I think that's a, a very wonderful insight. You're right. You should be focusing on $150 an hour techniques because you're losing money if you're not. One area that we've also struggled with is once you find yourself in a situation where you're constantly performing all the tasks, you now have to free up some of your time to train the other, you know, employees who you want to transition to. And that's that's kind of a challenge as well. Well, yeah, so that's part of the process. That's why it's not just snap your fingers and it's done, right? So, so we have to figure out, first off, when we talk about training, we say we have to define what it is that we want. We have to define when it gets done, who does it, why it gets done, what's the input, what's the output, what are all of those things, right? And then we have to be able to tell somebody else, this is how it works, right? And as we're, as we're teaching them, do you think they're perfect at it on day one? No. No. So now what you've got is they have their own learning curve, right? And you can do a little break-even analysis and say, listen, I'm willing to spend a month or two months or whatever that is training. But at this point, at this point, you should have all of this stuff. And then we can test to make sure that each one of those things that they're moving and making progress in each one of those items. Would you ask somebody to learn and memorize 100 things all at once? No. I yeah, you'd say, look, here's the first thing I want you to do. Here's the second thing I want you to do, right? So it's not just a big dump, right? There's a process for doing that. And, you know, for many business owners, they're very good at understanding their products and services. But this other stuff, you know, this is not where their skill set lies. And it's not unfair. Uh, we'll talk about advisors getting the right people at the right time. But, but you know, you need to learn how to do that stuff. So the other key component to this is that, you know, a lot of people that are entrepreneurs, at some point they want to build their business and they'd like to sell it. They'd like to give it on to somebody else. And we have to understand that in the studies and the analysis, um, you know, 80% of the sales price of a business is based on the entrepreneur role, that's the products and services, and the management system, right? And then we understand also that about 80% of that 80% is really based on the products and services, right? So if you think about where your $150 items are, they're in the products and services. Right? That's where you're doing. How do I find clients? How do I sell clients? How do I build better products? How do I build better services? That is typically where you need to spend your time if you're going to earn that rate that you want to that you want to earn. Okay, so let's talk about this. Understanding this model, understanding this process. Um, where is it? Do you think that? Um, and I'm not going to do the next one. Um, where is it that you think you know you could you could start looking at? What are some of the things you could start doing differently today? to start being able to spend more time in the entrepreneurial model, entrepreneurial role. Well, let's look, take a look at, you know, an administrative task such as billing. I've, in my mind, always want to be in charge to know how much billing goes in, sending out the invoices. And I've started that delegation process, but I still have a handle on it. I'm, I'm hesitant to fully let it go. Uh, and I know that that does take time. So if a client comes to me and says, can you send me a copy of your invoice? In my mind, I feel like, let me just go ahead and send it, whereas I could just f send it over to you know one of our associates who handles that and just be done with it. But in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, I can just get it done now and not have to worry about it. But what happens, you know, those tasks add up. 
as mm -hmm. I mentioned before. So, so what, what would make you comfortable just having A, the client going to that other person instead of going to you in the first place? I think I need to just do it. I think I just need to let it go. I, I trust my associates implicitly. I know that they have our best interests in mind. I think I just need to, to go ahead and do it. Maybe I could start by take, you know, getting an update from them you know, on, a, on a frequent basis. How's it coming along? And then ultimately just letting them handle it. And I check into it once in a while. So would you want to uh, train your client to be more effectively deal with your organization? Yes, I know I should do that. So they could go to the right person instead of you. Yes. And again, you're there and you're happy. You want to provide good customer service. But um, at the end of the day, you know, every minute counts. Uh, and if you're looking at $150 an hour, you'd actually put a cost of value on every one of those minutes, right? <laughs> That's, That's true. almost three bucks a minute. That's true. <laughs> um, so, so, so you could train your customer to do that. And then, and then you want to be knowledgeable, you want to be aware of what's going on, right? So what could your associate provide to you um, on a routine basis that would help you be more knowledgeable or more aware of what those activities are? An, an accounting report, maybe on a biweekly or a monthly basis that just shows what went out, possibly copying me. Uh, since we use an electronic invoicing system, which sends out invoices by email, I could be copied on that. Just take one second to take a look at it. I don't have to do any analysis. Those are some items that, that would help. Yeah, and I might <laughs> point you away from the email and getting copied on every little piece, right? Because that is draining as well. That will take your time, <laughs> right? So so that's where the, the information systems come into play. So, so if you have a big accounting system, uh, and it's really a matter of building a system and a process, right? So, and the process starts with how does the request come in? And you could go through, you know, any number of different things that you have going on and say, listen, I need to make this shift. I need to train my client to go here. I need to do uh, X. I need to have a reporting system that supports it so I know what's going on. Uh, and then you probably have to have some sort of a review system, right? So that you don't just, uh, you know, let it go. I mean, you want to continuous improve, continuously improve your process. Okay, so billing is one place, what's another? Sure. Another could be responding to phone messages and emails that don't necessarily require my time. I like to make sure that my clients know that I'm involved every step of the way, so I kind of take that maybe a step too far, and I like to be involved with any type of response, even if it's something that I know one of my associates could handle. Uh, and that's something I'm, I'm trying to work on as well. So if an email comes in um, and the client knows one of my associates, I should be able to just forward it and have them respond to it. You yeah, know, and even back up the ladder, right? Do we train that client to send the email to somebody else? It's true, right? Because they want a good, good service. Right? <laughs> One of the things I know for me, right? If everything comes into me and I have to take care of everything, right? And I'm working with a client. We're we're doing this show right now. I'm not answering the phone, right? If you really want something done for me quickly, you shouldn't come to me, right? And not that I don't care. Not that it's not important. I do. I you know I really want to jump into it, but I can't. Right? And, and so in order for me to provide the best service to you possible, I have to give you other avenues to get that kind of information. You know, And that's, that's just looking at it and saying, look, this is actually in the best interest of the client that's true. to be able to, to do that kind of thing. So positioning you know, all of that stuff, can we get it? So, so it never even enters your, your system and you get the, you get the focus. Because there's a mental energy shifting from item A to item B, et cetera, that, uh, that costs you time and energy. Okay, what's, what's one more thing? So, sure. so emails and shifting those off. Billing and shifting that off. What else? Possibly, if a client wants to come in after a meeting and just ha you know just has several questions, a lot of times I'll take them into my office and and we'll talk and we'll end up talking for an hour and a half, whereas it could have been something that another one of my associates could have handled and I could have just come in to say hello, let them know that I'm on top of it. But again, my mentality is I want to be involved, uh, even if it's something that I know my associate can handle. Um, so I'm working on that as well. So let's talk about meetings for just a minute because sure. this is something that's really important for a lot of people. And, and you know, they, they often don't, don't have a good way to manage the time associated with meetings, right? So there's always a little meet and greet and a little relationship building, but then we want to get into it and get things finished, right? So when it comes to managing a meeting and managing time for meetings, right, what's the most effective way you can think of to do that? You should probably prepare an agenda, at least an informal agenda right. in your mind. Yeah. Uh, I've had trouble doing that because I always – Plan it in my mind, but I should probably, you know, formalize it. Right. I think that would probably help a lot. Well, I actually write one down, right? And then I tell the person that I have an agenda. Now, if my client's coming in, I say, what is your agenda? Right, so that we establish what that is first so that we can stay focused. Um, and the other thing that we try to do is we try to time-bound the session, 
we try to say, hey, listen, we can only, you know, that we need to get this done in a half an hour, or how much time do you have? Because if we don't set a boundary, you know, it'll, it'll often go through there and we'll say, oh my God, we've been talking for 45 minutes and we haven't even addressed the, the particular issue. Right. Um, so being able to manage that, and then if they give you their agenda in advance, if you have some way to do that, right, then it easily tells you that you're an associate or somebody else could handle it, right? I'm going to have Susie do it because she can take care of it right now, right? And if you want me, um, it's going to be a little bit longer to be able to get that done. Um, so, so those are three things that we can do. So what, let's, let's recap. What are the three things you're going to do? So we have some billing issues that I could, instead of, you know, looking over So instead over of everything. saying I could, <laughs> do you say I will? I will. I will. I right? will. This is a commitment. Yes. Okay. All right. So the billing issues. What else? Responding to every email and phone call that comes in. So transitioning those. Transitioning I'm those. going to transition those. I will. And an idea that I just had uh, that I do for the most part is when a client comes into the office to meet for the first time, uh, I will make it a point to introduce them to the rest of the team so that they know who everybody is. That would actually streamline the process a lot as well. Right, right, because they already have the relationship, right? And then right. what was the last thing we were talking about? Streamlining an agenda. Streamlining agenda for, for meetings, for managing meetings meeting. in, in more time possible. Exactly. Okay, excellent. Like so, so really good, <laughs> really good items. And, you know, the thing about this show that's really fun is once we kind of establish this concept of the three as the entrepreneur, then we can go in and we can say, um, you know, can we come up with three different things, right? Come up, so you've got three different action items, four actually that you, you came up with today. All right, so like in, in, in closing, as we wrap this thing up, um, I want you to take a few minutes and share your best advice to the audience. Sure. What, is, what are the top things okay. that you say? Number one, if you're starting a small business, even if you're established, uh, no matter what your tax situation is, it's very, very important to get the right advisors in place uh, from the start. A good CPA, accountant, a good attorney, a good business coach, a good financial planner, whatever the case is, when you run a business, you have a million different and things you on your mind at any given at time. You can't. Right? So you, you have can't. to have great professional advisors. You have to have great advisors. Excellent. You need to have a budget. You need to prepare a budget and you need to stick with it to the best that you can. In fact, in my experience, working with clients who have fallen behind, I find that those clients who have worked with the budget, even if they're making an effort and it's not 100% perfect, they can always improve on it. But I've in my mind, I estimate I've seen 50% improvement over clients who aren't working with budgets. So you could, just by having a budget and trying to manage, so building it to the best of your ability and trying to manage it, 50% more efficiency, 50% I would estimate at least better that. returns. Exactly. That's pretty impressive. I would say, and as far as that relates to my business, when you have a budget, you can adequately prepare and plan for making those tax payments, those estimated tax payments that you don't have to worry about when you're an employee, um, you know, you can actually get those paid off and really right, you know a big fixed, part of right? this. And exactly. what was the last thing? And, and speaking of accounting, as a small business owner or even an individual, it's very important to have an accounting system in place, whether it be QuickBooks or Quicken, somewhere where you can track what's coming in and what's going out. That's a very important aspect an as effective, well. An effective accounting system. An effective accounting right? system. There's a, there's a variety of different choices out there. Right. But having one and using it to... Uh, certainly better report where you're at today but also better planning so right. that you can and that's where your budget goes and all that right. and and one final area that i want to address as well that i'm very passionate about is when you receive correspondence from the government the irs the california franchise tax board division of taxation do not ignore those letters a lot of times they could come in maybe there's a mistake maybe there, there's not but the problem will not go away on its own those the correspondence needs to be addressed either by your advisor by us by the client themselves, you know, don't ignore the letters. And that's what I like to educate clients on. Thank you so much. Thank, you know, it's, it's, it's a big help and I appreciate your coming on the show today. Sure. Uh, before we exit, um, what was the experience like? Well, it's amazing. I came onto the show and I have learned a lot more uh, than I knew before I, before I started the show. And I'm grateful for that. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the opportunity to educate our viewers on uh, some of the tax issues as well. Yeah, well thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, John. Andrew Grieber, it. we'll see you all next week.